Goal kicking, box kicking, punt kicking, drop kicking, baby kicking, kicking and screaming, kicking children out the house. There are many different types of kicking, and the Rugby World Cup has brought to the forefront the importance of kicking in rugby. So strap in, warm up your calves, quads and hamstrings, as I, your professor, discuss the role of kicking in rugby. So first up, the history. Kicking in rugby has been a part of it since its initial inception, with the game allegedly being originally formed from football. And so it has had a prominent role in the sport, and has crossed over to rugby sister sports like rugby league and American football, with it being equally crucial as a tactical weapon for both sports. So let's discuss the different types of kicking, how they're done, why they're done, and how effective they are when they're done. First up, goal kicking. Now, goal kicking was my favourite bit about rugby when I was a young boy. And I don't know if any of you guys know this, but I'm an international goal kicker myself. Oh, you didn't know? My god. Well, I was 100%, two from two, one of the few international 100% goal kickers in the world. Yeah? Yeah. What were we talking about? Oh yeah, as a young man there was just something aesthetically pleasing about seeing the ball sail through the uprights. And I used to go into my garden to try and emulate my first love in terms of goal kicking, the man, the myth, the legend, Neil Jenkins. I loved him. The ginger hair. The hairline. The fact he always cleaned the mud off his boots before every kick. He was the bomb. My dad had a videotape, yes a videotape, of the Lions Tour of South Africa in 2009. And Neil Jenkins was one of the main stars of that tour for his goal kicking. Furthermore, he was the person who introduced me to the concept of goal kicking being a massive weapon for teams to rack up points, as with the game being as complex as it is, there are bound to be infringements from teams trying to gain an edge in our wonderful sport. Meaning having a decent goal kicker is something that is extremely valuable to teams and coaches. The ability to say to your opposition, if you give a penalty away on your own half, we will get three points. That's powerful stuff. And as my knowledge of rugby and its history grew, I began to see that Neil Jenkins wasn't the only man of this talent. Gareth Hastings, Rob Andrew, Phil Bennett, Barry John all blew my little child mind. And then I discovered my ultimate childhood hero, and the man who if I met in person I would probably melt, Johnny Wilkinson. So you know how I talked about how Neil Jenkins introduced me to the concept of being a goal kicking machine who wins his team games? Well, Neil Jenkins in terms of being a goal kicking machine is kind of like a PlayStation 2 solid gaming console got some really good games on there like Rugby Away, which on an unrelated note I played on this channel. Please sub, daddy needs you. Anyway, Johnny Wilkinson was like a PS4 VR experience, which was released way before its time, like in an era where people were still trying to come up with the technology for a PS3. Johnny just came in and whipped out his P. S4. And I feel like this metaphor has got away from me slightly. Anyway, Johnny Wilkinson's two to three year era of dominance at the international stage showed the real value of goal kicking as a weapon to win games. As well as being very efficient in another type of kicking which we will get into in a sec, but first we must talk about the different types of goal kicking. Now you usually have two types of goal kickers in teams. You have your accuracy guys and your power guys. For example of accuracy guys, think of the most boring 10 you can think of, then him. It's him, you're Steven Milers. Who else can I throw under the bus? I'll just leave it there, actually. And Johnny Wilkinson and Neil Jenkins fall into this category as well. Very accurate from basically anywhere within 40 metres. And then you've got your power guys, your Elliot Dalys, your Francois Staines, men with such quad and foot strength that they get their kicks from their own 10 metre line, which is a massive weapon and a major point of difference in your team. But unfortunately for these guys, they are very rarely the main goal kicker for their team. And the reason for this is that these guys are actually so powerful, it's quite hard to be accurate when the ball literally just flies off your foot at the speed of light. Although I feel like someone just needs to take a chance on these guys and get them used to kicking the closer ones. And then we'll have the PS5 Elite Pro Turbo Boost of goal kickers. But it's easier said than done. And as another reason long distance kickers find it hard to kick up close is their technique and choice of kicking tee. Now there are a few different types of kick and tees in the rugby world in my opinion. The ones that are really low for more accuracy, the midway ones where you have the power and also a bit of accuracy, and the big tall boomy ones. And of course how could I forget? the old school cones. First, the really low ones, used by your Johnny Wilkinsons, your Charlie Hodgson's, points machines and accurate. The reason they use this tee is because with the lower tee there's more contact time with the ball in an area where you can control it. Furthermore, it allows you to place the ball in a position that almost makes it impossible to miss from close range. The downside, it really limits the distance you can put on the ball. I don't care how powerful you are, if you're kicking the ball from this low your max is around 50 meters and that's pushing it and being very generous. Next up, let's talk about the big tall boomy ones, the exact opposite of the low ones used by the dailies, the stains, to make sure you can get as much force through the ball as you can, at an angle where the ball will just fly and fly and fly. This kind of tee is also used by Owen Farrell, which initially I thought was weird until I ended up using this tee when I played for Jamaica. I don't know if I mentioned it anyway. I realised that this type of tee can be useful from close range if you don't hit the ball that hard and just focus on accuracy and just sort of stroke it through. It's almost impossible to slice the ball. The only issue when you use it is when you have to kick across yourself. For example, if you're a right foot kicking on the right side of the pitch, it's hard to judge how far you need to swing your foot across. You have less contact time with the ball, 
especially when you compare it to the low kicking tee. This type of kick is harder anyway, but yeah, with this tee it adds an extra layer of difficulty, which is why people use the midway ones. Now the midway ones are the most popular in the rugby world, giving you the best of both the rugby worlds. The height needed to get some distance on your kicks, whilst also giving the accuracy to have your tee down low to give you that extra control, with the ability to angle it at whichever angle you prefer. But what I believe to be the best kicking tee is the relatively old school cone bitch, Bring the cone back, get one that's nice and thin so you can only point it straight, upright, no cheating. Shout out to all my cone warriors, Frederick Michelac and the other bold French town whose name escapes me. You're the real MVPs. And that concludes the point scoring aspect of kicking in rugby. Except it doesn't, because it's time to talk about drop kicking. Now drop kicking is one of the hardest skills to learn in rugby, and despite years of doing it, if someone asked me to execute a perfect one, I would probably feel more nervous than you would believe. It's terrifying, but this skill has been responsible for some of the most exciting and clutch moments in rugby. Rugby World Cup history, Yanni De Beer, Johnny Wilkinson, Stephen Larkham, Joel Stransky, all blew up in relevance and prominence due to their ability to hit a drop goal when it mattered. And when you think about the mechanics of a drop kick, it seems to be pretty simple. Drop the ball vertically with the point of the ball facing you, then as it drops, swing your foot through it as you would with a goal kick. Simple, right? Wrong! These are the things you need to remember while drop kicking. First up, are you moving forward or standing still? There are two ways to drop kick a ball. You either stand still, planting your standing foot and very precisely moving your body, or you do the run and gun. The run and gun is for distance and standing is for accuracy. That's why Larkham ran and the kickoff stay still. Next, you have how do you want to drop the ball? This is the most difficult part of the drop goal, as no matter how good and clean your form and swing is, if the ball drops in the wrong way, it can all go to pot. So, with your drop, you have about four options. The first two are where you drop it. You can either drop it slightly far away from you, or in tight. The pros and cons are, tight gives you little room to make a mistake, as your foot only has so much room to go whilst kicking the ball, and thus is more accurate. However, it's less powerful. Whereas going wide with it is wild, but if you get it right, the ball will soar. But it's very hard to do consistently. The next two are how you drop the ball, and what I mean by this is, do you want the ball to be at an angle or straight vertical? Pros are vertical, it's consistent, what you see is what you get, it's like kicking off an elevated cone, and if you have your form right, you'll be consistent as hell. But having the ball drop at an angle enables you, the kicker, to have a lot more freedom in terms of options. Kickers most of the time like the ball to be angled in a certain way, to help them find the sweet spot and put simply to just make their job easier. And this is the same case for drop goals. Tilting backwards, more height. Tilting sideways, more surface area to hit. And if you're going for distance, a combination of both is decent. And finally, the last thing you need to think about in the drop goal is how do you want to catch the ball? Now this might sound silly and probably only relevant to drop kicks happening while the ball is in play, but you'll be surprised how many drop goal attempts are derailed by a shoddy pass or catch. So if you find yourself in the pocket, my advice would be to yourself, set early at the angle you prefer drop kicking at, side on, front on, in between, whatever you like to do, do it. Then put your hands wherever you want to catch the ball, then you're set, and if the scrum half passes it to you anywhere but there, you can either adjust with more time than you usually would have and make it or miss. And and it's not your fault and you can have a real go at him for his incompetence. Sound good? I'm glad. Next up, kicking in open play. Now, kicking in open play in rugby has evolved massively since the dawn of professionalism, mostly due to the newfound importance of organised kick chase. Gone are the days where you can just kick the ball upfield without a real care in the world. It's also made it a lot harder to attack off kicks, as you're in general now facing a massive defensive wall. In fact, defences in general being so much better than any other point in history where the upward curve of quality that seemingly has no sign of slowing down has made all types of kicking in open play very important. As kicking in the modern professional game is now used as a way to get the ball back in a more beneficial place than the one you were in before you kicked the ball, with the opposition either being pressured into a mistake or a bad kick, where you get the line out somewhere beneficial to your team. Well, that's the plan anyway. So you have four different types of kicks to try and execute this very pragmatic game plan. You have the bomb, the chip, the grubber and the straight up punt kick, and each of them can be very useful when done in the correct scenario. The bomb is an opportunity to either chase your own kick or have someone else chase it and have a contest in the air to try and regain the ball further up the pitch. Doing this kind of kick is pretty simple, you have the ball drop vertically and then you try and get under it as much as possible, trying to kick upwards as much as you can whilst also having the ball go forwards. You often see people use this method when returning a kick from the opposition and you don't really see anything you can do in attack, so you just pop a bomb. It's often seen as a very negative and boring move, which is true, kinda, but if you become a master of it like Dan Bigger, it's pretty damn impressive. Next, the chip. Now the term chip is universal, you have it in a number of other sports, but the chip in rugby, aside from being used for silky solo tries, is often used to beat blitz defences, either as a way of deterring them from wanting to blitz as hard by putting the ball behind them, or to have one of your teammates run onto it, gaining ground or scoring. This is the same reason that people use the next type of kicking, which is grubber kicking. Grubbering is usually done for the same reasons as chipping, but you're kicking along the ground, kicking 
on the top of the ball, helping to kick it into the ground, but the grubber has the extra bonus of not allowing the opposition the opportunity to mark the ball, whilst also having the ball bouncing unpredictably as they scrambled to stop the situation from spiralling out of control. Speaking of control, that's what the last type of kick in rugby is about, the punt. It's all about controlling the game, as well as the ball when someone full on punts the ball in rugby. It's always about pressure, either applying it or relieving it. A punter has two choices of kick, the end of a end or the spiral. Now the spiral has slightly gone out of fashion in modern days, as I believe it's because it's way more unpredictable and harder to be precise in terms of where you're kicking, but it's by far the harder to catch if you're the one trying to field it, especially if the person kicking can get some height on it. Furthermore, if you've got some power behind you, you can literally kick for days. Best example I can think of is how Gavin Henson used to strike the ball. Jesus. It was sweet, but if you're looking for complete control of what you're doing, end over end is props better. Not as flary or cool, but you know, it works. And if you're going for a crossfield kick or a punt to touch, and you need it right on the money, I'd go end over end. But if you're going for distance, spiral it, do it, who cares if you slice it, live a little. Now for the last type of kicking in open play, the famous scrum half box kick. Now the box kick in rugby has been around for yonks, used as an excellent way of clearing your lines when you're in a prickly situation, and used as a way of kicking but not having to go back into the pocket and lose ground. And the modern professional game has made it so that box kicking is its own separate mini game in rugby, with blockers being set in place, people trying to extend the ruck as much as possible to give the box kicker as much time as they need, and the goal of the box kick is simple, to kick the ball long enough that you're clearing your lines and relieving pressure for your team, but high enough so that you can compete in the air and actually try and win the ball back higher up the field. And having your nine kick from the ruck is also a clever way to implement the other types of kicking that I've mentioned before, chips, trying to catch the opposition out on the back foot, and all of these types of kicks have been on full display in this year's World Cup and are now becoming more important than ever. We've already talked about the impact of Johnny Wilkinson and how he was a game changer who showed the possibilities and benefits of a point scoring machine in your team. Well now rugby itself is changing and kicking is a major part of it, for better and for worse depending on your perspective on it. Rugby teams have adapted to the fact that kickers are better and players skill sets are better by trying to negate turnovers in their own half as defences are so good in normal play. But if it's turnover ball it's chaos for up to three phases until a team can get settled. And we've seen so many tries because of this and it often seems to be the only time that defences look fragile, so teams aren't wanting to risk playing with the ball really before the halfway line, so the role of the aerial contest on a box kick in the 15 meter channel, and the role of tactical kicking to space from your playmakers has become massive, but it can look a little aimless at times, and if you're not doing it with purpose it can be very frustrating to watch. And I think this is due to the fact that this kind of play is still pretty new in terms of professional sport, and we'll probably look back on the games now like I look at games before the pro era, sort of like, oh, there's a lot of space there, this feels a little aimless. And that's okay, but on the bright side it's always improving, and this World Cup has actually been a showcase of how good kicking can be exciting. And that concludes today's class. I hope you've enjoyed. Signed, N-G-J. Oh, except when England do it. That's boring as